true stories that make us say, wow, God, wow, God, wow, God. And for the first time in my life, I felt that spirit of God pulling me to that altar and I wanted to change. I wanted to give my heart to God for me and for God. I was around the age of like 24 last year. My addiction got so bad to the point where I was homeless. Homeless and I was searching for something spiritual. I don't even need to convince you. Just come hear my story, see my life, and you'll know that he's real and that he's able. You'll get to hear more of those stories play out today on this Wow God Stories with Lisa Williams. That's me and my dear friend, Ann Sorensen. And thank you, Ann, for helping collect the stories this week. And not just me, it was Jason. It was Meredith. So this was a group effort of people wanting to share stories about addiction. For the past few weeks, part of my job is I travel helping Christian radio stations tell their story. And I am thin right now, you know, emotionally thin and physically, you know, I'm in the last stretch of that journey. And so I appreciate it. It takes a team. It does take a team. And just that word you use, Lisa, that how you're feeling thin in some ways, the episode that we're sharing today is so appropriate because when we do feel thin, we're more susceptible to those addictive tendencies. Yep. Let's talk about addiction because that is the theme of today's show. I had to do a lot of studying on addiction because of someone very close to me who had an addiction that was so detrimental. And I didn't know the definition is something you don't want to do, but you continue doing it. But when we share our stories with others, we're taking that. You take the power away from the addiction. Yeah, you take the power away. That's so, that's so truly. So you take the power away from it and you give light to it and then God can move. So our hope for you today is that you will find strength for your journey through these three wow God stories that you're about to hear. The first from Michael Savage, who eloquently tells you the story of being trapped and then being set free. And then we move to a second story. It's a really brief story or snapshot from a listener whose name is Dalen. And then Jeremy Rosado, who makes amazing music. You might recognize his name because he was on The Voice. He was on American Idol. You'll be able to hear his larger story on Meredith Foster's podcast, The Unfolding. But for today, you'll hear a portion of his story as he and his family dealt with addiction. Thank you for being with us today as we listen to these three men tell their wow God stories. In 2009, my addiction had completely destroyed my life. I had already been through multiple programs, AA and NA, and all those programs are great, but they always left me just wanting more. I was always white knuckling it. At the end of the day, I had been through several halfway houses and treatment centers in the St. Louis area, but the addiction, it just continued to grow. And at the climax of it, a heroin addiction had completely just robbed me of my identity, any dignity I had in my life. I was stealing from my mom, my sisters. I was robbing everybody just to supply my habit. And I just hated myself for that. You know, I felt a shame over that, but the addiction had just consumed my life. And I, I found myself having burnt like every bridge in my life, homeless, living on the streets in St. Louis, Missouri. You know, I was that guy that you'd see on the side of a highway exit holding a sign asking people for money. That is what a lifetime of addiction did to my life. I was living in an abandoned house and I had cried out to God and I said, God, if you're real, make a way out of this for me. And I can't say that God spoke in a large audible voice. I didn't see a burning bush, but I will tell you there in the middle of an abandoned house, in the middle of a crack house in a city on the south side of St. Louis, when I cried out to God with a humble and a broken and a contrite spirit, his spirit showed up. And for the first time in my life, I felt the spirit of peace. From that moment on, when I called on the name of Jesus and his spirit showed up, I knew that he was real. And so from that moment on, it was a few weeks later, my father found me on the streets of St. Louis and he said that my old cell phone had been ringing and he had it. I couldn't even pay the bill anymore. And he said a guy named Jeffrey who had been through a program in Champaign-Urbana 
Illinois called Lifeline Connect. Uh, he was in that program, and, and he had been in another program with me prior to this. And he uh, got a hold of my father, and he said that I'm praying for Michael, and we want him to come to our program. So I got on the phone, and my dad pleaded with me. I had just gotten out of prison for stealing and forgery and for drugs and all these things, and that was an identity that I carried for many years. 173474. That was my inmate number in prison. And those beliefs I had about myself was I was no good. Nobody wanted me anymore. I had messed up. I had gone way too far and there was no hope for me anymore. And I was at the bottom of the line and uh, and I didn't think I could make it out. But my dad talked me into it and I picked up the phone and I called Lifeline Connect and they accepted me into the program. And I remember one of the pastors speaking and preaching one day, and he was preaching on humility, humbling yourself before the Lord and having a broken and contrite spirit, preaching out of James. And it said to humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. And for the first time in my life, I felt that spirit of God pulling me to that altar. And I wanted to change. I wanted to give my heart to God for me and for God. I didn't want to do it for the judge or for my mom or for my dad or for the girlfriend, but for the first time in my life, I really wanted real change. And I felt the Spirit of God call me to that altar, and I went down to that altar and gave my uh, life uh, to the Lord. And from that moment on, He filled me with His Spirit. He began to break the chains of the addiction in my life, and I still had a lot of work to do, but I knew I had the the hope in my heart. And I was in that program uh, for a year. And I remember one instance in particular where I just had a moment with God that had forever changed me. I was in a counseling session and the counselor, Randy Brown, asked me to close my eyes and we began to pray. And we were talking about my belief systems and how I didn't think I was any good and how I was carrying uh, this identity as a criminal. And he asked me to close my eyes and we began to pray. And he said, describe your situation. And I began to describe myself sitting in the courtroom. I was in my uh, brown fatigues. I was in the county jail and they were getting ready to sentence me. And the judge walked in the room and everybody stood and they began to read all my charges. And they began to read off all these things that I had messed up, all these things that I had done. And they were all true. And I was guilty. And he said, okay, I'm getting ready to pray again. And he said, Jesus is getting ready to walk in the room. And he had me close my eyes and he began to pray. And in my mind's eye, in the spirit, Jesus walked into that courtroom. And even though they just sentenced me, Jesus put his hand on my shoulder and he began to speak to me. And I began to describe these things. And Jesus told me that I am not my failures and that I am not guilty. And that day, Jesus, he broke some chains in me. He began to change an identity in me that I carried for so many years. You know, that identity that I'm not worthy, that I'm unwanted, that I'm a criminal. That day, the love of God began to break the chains of that identity in my life and he set me free. And I walked out of that room knowing that the spirit of God had liberated me and it had set me free. And God began to do many miracles in my life and I had completed that program. I moved back to St. Louis and I was clean for five years and uh, things were going amazing. He called me to the ministry. I began to speak to youth groups and at churches, and I was studying the scriptures and going through classes and courses. He had a plan for my life, and I met my wife, and, and we got married, and things were going amazing for five years. We were on our way to church one night, New Year's Eve, and we got hit by a car. And I wound up in a hospital that night, and it jacked my back up, and I started to see the doctors. And I had always told them, look, I'm a recovering opiate addict. Don't give me any narcotics. And they prescribed me something called tramadol, which is technically not a narcotic on paper, but it had sent me into a terrible relapse. It actually does hit the opiate receptors in the brain, even though chemically it's not a narcotic. I was secretly addicted to these pills, and I felt like the spirit of evil was like, check mark, I got you. Here I was, a preacher, a guy that was sharing the gospel, and I'm secretly addicted to these pills on the side. And just all that shame and all that guilt, you know, it just destroyed me from the inside out. And the biggest mistake I made was not telling anybody. 
I just felt like the enemy just, he kept my mouth shut and things just began to fall apart. And I got into such a dark place, I tried to take my life. I got a bunch of heroin. My wife is recently pregnant and things were going well in my life. And I felt like I threw it all away. And I went and got all these drugs and I went into a bathroom and I stuck my back up against the door and my feet up against the vanity. And I just said goodbye to this world and I, and I did a heroin and I completely blacked out. And the next thing I know, I woke up in the ICU. What had happened was is that my dad, my own father had been pursuing me and he knew I was trying to go off of the deep end. And my dad knew that I had gotten some drugs and he got a key to my apartment and he got in that apartment and he fought his way into that bathroom and he pulled me out of that bathroom and he said, I was as blue as can be. I had a needle in my arm and I was almost gone. There was no heartbeat left and he called the ambulance and he started to pray and he did CPR and he's pleading with God to save his son and the paramedics arrived and they gave me several doses of what's called Narcan to bring you out of an overdose of heroin and on the third dose they found a faint heartbeat and they took me to the hospital and I was in a coma for nine days on a ventilator and they didn't know if I was going to make it or not but I had so many people that were praying for me and my wife was just pleading with God to not let me go And all I can say is that God, he still had a plan for my life. There was still a heartbeat and there was still some work that he had for me to do. And I made it out of the hospital and I made it back to that program that saved my life. And I got real with God and I said, God, I just want you to use this failure in my life. And I just began to share the love of God. And I'm so glad I didn't give up, you know. And I got out of the ICU and the directors of the program were on their way to pick me up. And I was sitting there and just the shame and the guilt and just the dread of what had happened, it started to hit me. And there was this little old lady that was busting tables and she came by my table and she asked me how I was doing. And I told her, I'm not doing too well. And she said, you know what today is? And I said, what's that? And she said, today is the only day of the year that tells you to do something. Today is March forth and you need to march forth and you need to go forward and you never need to look back and i tell you right there the spirit of god it just gave me the courage you know and that encouragement at the moment to get back up on my feet you know because my wife was a few months pregnant with our first child and i knew that that little girl was going to need a daddy so i had to have a lot of courage to face my fears and my uh, failures And it was the love of God that took me by the hand and just walked me right back into recovery. And all the people, you know, my pastors and the leaders in my life, they all came beside me and just began to love me and speak life over me. And that's what the body of Christ does. The church is a hospital for the broken. And they just began to put me back together piece by piece. And now today, I'm a homeowner. I have a great job. I have a great family. Um, I have three children now. God has just continued to do miracles in my life. He's completely restored me in the ministry. I'm still preaching the gospel. I'm still sharing my story. And I just want to encourage somebody out there that's listening to this. It doesn't matter if you feel like you're living in a graveyard, living amongst the tombs, so to speak. When Jesus shows up on the scene and you open your heart to him, run to him, then complete a restoration and forgiveness is, is possible. And, uh, and I just want to encourage somebody out there, you still have a heartbeat. God still has a purpose for your life. Hi, my name is Dalen. Ever since I was young, I've had addiction problems. It was addiction with all types of things, and it just continued to get worse as I came into my early 20s. And then I was around the age of like 24 last year, it, my addiction got so bad to the point where I was homeless. I didn't have anything. I was homeless and I was searching for something spiritual. And I'd ask God to save me and I didn't realize in that moment that that's what He was doing. And now I have almost been sober for a year and the Lord pulled me out of all of that. I have a purpose to live for now. I just have joy and peace and happiness that surpasses all understanding. And my mom suffers from uh, a mental illness that's really tough on her and we just feel our our space with the Lord. The Lord has just done so many great things and I'm so forever grateful.
I've got a 20 year old daughter. She's biologically my niece. I have had the great pleasure and, and honor and the greatest gift of my life above all of this to become her dad. Just a little bit after American Idol, I became her dad. So it's been about a decade. My sister has had a drug addiction her entire adult life and it never let her be the mom she needed to be. And so that gave me the opportunity to step up. So Jossie is my baby girl. When my sister actually lost custody of Jocelyn, Jocelyn was two years old. My parents had just divorced and it was just me and my mom. And I started to learn how to become a dad when I was 13 to Jocelyn. I remember one night her just crying and she was just trying to figure out why she couldn't be with her mom. And I remember holding her and rocking her to sleep when I was 13. And I remember looking up at the ceiling because in my mind, God's like right up there. I remember vividly telling him, God, if you provide and make a way, I'll spend the rest of my life making sure she never feels like this again. That she feels loved and protected and provided for, I'll do it. And God's been faithful. After American Idol came to Nashville, watching my mom struggle to raise Jossie alone, I remember that conversation I had with God when I was 13. I know this sounds crazy. This has been my life. And I don't know, something just told me to step in. And so I did. And I traded. I didn't get the record deal. We put out a record independently. And I just went home. And I got a job on a church staff because I wanted to do this and legally did the paperwork to become her dad and so that I could take her to a doctor's appointment or register, you know, apply for school and all the things. I mean, I'm 31 now, I'm like 21, 22. Like my mom helped and, and God provided, God kept his promise to that 13 year old, you know, when I was 13, I had that conversation with him. And so I put away the music and I, I gave up the dream. I didn't think it was ever going to happen. And I was okay with being able to do church staff. I was at a mega church to be completely like honest. So it was like full production, like crazy, like level. And it was really fun. And it was ministry. And I got to tell these people about Jesus and encourage them. And I love the local church. I really do. I love being a worship leader. But I always had this thing in me that told me that it was more than these four walls, but it just wasn't happening. And so about two and a half years ago from here, from now, the voice reached out through email about casting. I was like, there's no way. They know who I was and they know I did Idol so many years ago. Back then, you couldn't do both shows. So I was like, there's no way they're going to put me on The Voice after I did American Idol. And, and they did. <laughs> and I started the process. And I remember talking to the Lord and being like, God, are you about to give me another chance? Is this about to happen? Jocelyn at this point is graduating high school. Like, I'm not raising a 10, 11 year old kid anymore, you know? And so he's so real and he's so perfect, man. And he, he made a way. And I did The Voice. Team Kelly Clarkson. Thank you, Jesus, for Kelly Clarkson. So here I am on the show. And I told the Lord, I was like, man, God, if you if you allow me to make it far enough, I'll, I want to worship you on the show. I want to lead 10 million people in worship. I want to tell them who you are. I remember going to the production staff and everything I kept making in America, kept voting. And I was like, what's going on? Like, <laughs> this is weird, man. But they wouldn't give me a worship song. And I'd given them a list of songs. I'm like, guys, any of them. I don't care which one. And then finally, I went to Kelly Clarkson and she went to them and was like, he's going to be a Christian artist when he gets off of this. You need to let that part of the industry know that he's here. And this is the truest version of him. He's going to sing a worship song, like pick which one, but it's going to be one of these. So shout out to her. It gives me chills to this day. and so amazing. And so I got to sing Reckless Love the next week and I got to lead millions of people. And I remember the hundreds and hundreds of messages that began to come in on my social media of people that were just fans of me for the show. They were like, you know what? I've I've never heard a Christian song before. I don't really know who Jesus is. Like, thank you for introducing me to him tonight. Something happened when you sang tonight. And, and I'm like, man, if this is the reason like I came here, or, and if this is what it was for, like, this is worth everything. I made the top nine. And then I, I got eliminated. She told me, you can find it on YouTube. And she was like, Jeremy, gospel music, Christian music. I have no doubt it's going to wrap their arms around that God-given talent that you have. Are you going to do incredible things? And then when we cut and we weren't live on TV anymore, she said, we got this. Here's my number. I'm going to give you everything that I have, every bit of access that I have. When you go into these record labels, you tell them that you've got me on your side. I will advocate for you. I'll promote for you. Whatever you want to do, I will be there to help you. And she has stood so true to her promises. I mean, I did her talk show. I performed in January. We interviewed and she's been so involved. I don't know what I did 
I just know that this was all the Lord's plan. Like none of this makes sense to me, but it's God and it's been God and it's always going to be God. And I'm soaking in every second of it because all of that that I've been through makes this feel so much more worth it. You know, our story is like a still a daily story. Like this isn't something we've lived in. Like my sister has had a drug addiction for Jocelyn's entire life. So that's not been easy. But again, God has been perfect and he sustained us and he's making dreams come true and he's bringing provision that we've not seen before. And he's just he's just doing exceedingly abundantly more than I could ask or imagine could be true. I'm living that right now. My sister is still one of my favorite people in the entire world. The addiction that she's had doesn't stop me from loving the human that she is. You talk about my supporters. You talk about somebody who's believed in me since I was a little boy. It's that girl. I have a song called Come and See. The song's about my sister, Amy. I signed my record deal. We had our like celebration of like, my mom was here, my daughter was here. I'm here at Capitol Records and I'm like, there's no way. But I had a co-write that afternoon. One of the songs that we wrote right after this celebration here at Capitol was Come and See. And we wrote it because as soon as I left here, my sister called me. You talk about high highs and low lows at the same time and the reality of life. She had just checked herself out of a rehab again. We'd been through the ups and downs and she was calling me. She was frantic on the phone. She was crying and she kept telling me, Jeremy, I just need you to give me a reason why I should do this. I'm about to go into another rehab. I'm, I'm standing outside the building. Honestly, it's like a terrible movie. She called me and she, and she just keeps telling me, is Jocelyn even going to love me? Is she ever going to give me a chance again? Like, why am I doing this? She's like, I need you to tell me a reason. And I don't know if you've ever had to deal with an addict, anybody watching or listening, but like, that mindset is different and they kind of just throw things at the wall and it's very quick. And I just kept trying to calm her down and telling her, Amy, the fact that you're even talking to me after you have overdosed three, four times in my lifetime and you're breathing, there has to be purpose on your life. Something is still to yet, yet to be accomplished. It's not over yet. I was like, I got to go. I'm going into the studio and co-writers being like, what do you want to write about? Well, I had already written so many songs for my sister, Amy about the journey, but I had not written her a song yet in faith for the future version of her. For the day she would finally be free, a song that she could declare and tell the world about. Come and see what God has done. Come and see what I've become. If you need proof that he's God and he can do anything, I don't even need to convince you. Just come hear my story, see my life, and you'll know that he's real and that he's able. And I remember writing this song, remembering the phone call I just had. Part of me believed that God is going to finally happen. The other part of me is struggling to believe in my flesh that we'd ever get there. We wrote this song 12, 13 months ago. What I didn't know was that God was turning it around. I couldn't see the big picture yet. <laughs> my sister has been free and clean and sober and on fire for Jesus for 10 months now. She loves Jesus and she's telling everybody that she sees. This is my song. Come and see what God's done. The song that I wrote in faith, believing that one day it could happen. She's at the front row of my show the other day, and I pop my ear out so I can hear the crowd. And I hear her in the front row singing, and she can't sing. It's really bad. <laughs> but she's singing her song, Come and see what God's done. If you need proof that he can do anything. And it's Amy's song. It is. But it's anybody's song that has ever walked through anything impossible that God made possible. Anybody who's seen he experienced healing, restoration, deliverance, freedom, big or small, this is your song to say, come and see what God's done. This is where we stand on the rooftop and we shout, he's God and he's real. And if you need proof, I don't even have to convince you, just come see my life, come hear my story and you'll know that he's God. But how perfect God is, that he would give me a dream, he would restore all of it, he would let my daughter be okay. And that he would heal my sister. And that he would finally free her. And that I would be able to stay and give her a kiss and give her a hug and tell her how proud I am. And thank her for not giving up. We pray that you will find the courage to live an incredible story, that your life would be a story that says, Wow, God. Wow, God. Wow, God. My wow, God story. I wanted to share a wow, God moment. That's my wow, God story. Praise God. And I'm so thankful to God for this wow, God moment. So, 
Thank you, God. (laughs) You've been listening to Wow God Stories, a Wow God production, a ministry of the University of Northwestern St. Paul. Discover more at wowgod.com.